In today's tutorial, we're going to create this abstract loop where we use Blender's hair particle system. In all of my tutorials last year, I think I've used the hair particle system only once. So it's about time that we take a slightly deeper dive into how we use Blender's particle systems for hair. So let's go ahead and actually begin the tutorial. In our default scene, we'll go ahead and select the default cube and tap X to delete it. Then we'll press Shift A and search for a mesh plane and we'll just press S5 to scale it up by 5 units. Then we'll select our camera and press Alt G to clear location followed by Alt R to clear rotation and then we can press G Z to lift it up just like that. Then we can press 0 to go into our camera view and then we're gonna go to our camera properties and just change the focal length down to something like 18 so that it becomes a lot more wide angle. Then we'll press G followed by Z to just bring it down until none of the outsides can be seen within the camera's view. Then we can go to our viewport display and expand past part 2 all the way to 1 so that we don't see anything outside our camera view. Now to go ahead and add in the actual hair for our plane, we can select the plane by tapping right here or selecting it from up here and then going to the particle properties. Here we'll press this plus button to create a new particle system and since we want it to be hair, We'll switch this from emitter to hair. Now the hair is currently way too long as you can see. So the first thing that we'll do is reduce the hair length from 4 meters to something as low as 0.4 meters. Now to make the deformations of the hair much smoother, we'll actually increase the segments from 5 to something like 7. You could go even higher if your laptop or PC can handle it. Then in our camera view, we want to ensure that we have the right density. And that's why we placed our camera initially rather than placing it at the end because from different angles, the hair might seem to be at different densities. So in our camera view, let's start off by increasing the number to something like 2000 and to make it look even more dense without necessarily increasing the pressure on our laptop too much, we can go down to children, expand it and choose interpolate it. Now that makes it a lot thicker. However, remember there's a dis there's a difference between the display amount and the render amount so if you actually increase the display amount to the render amount you can see how thick it actually is and this is the thickness with which it's going to be rendered however to help make the process much faster we can keep this display amount at 10 itself so that it won't lag or be too heavy while we create the next part of the tutorial so now we're going to go ahead and add in some amount of noise or distortion to these hair particles. So to do that, we're gonna press Shift A and search for a force field and you could choose many of them, but I'm going to use the turbulence force field because I think it's the fastest. Now back in our camera view, you can see that the actual size of the turbulence is a bit too chaotic. So to reduce that chaos, we can go ahead and go to our physics properties and increase the size. So as you see, by increasing the size, you can actually reduce the chaos of this particular turbulence force field. So you can choose a size that suits your scene the best. I think I'll go with a size of maybe 1.4 and that looks good enough. Apart from that, remember, you can always play around with the strength and all of that. But for now, I'll leave the strength at one itself. The next thing that I need to do is actually move this turbulence around to create the motion and make this a loop. If we take the empty and move it around, you can see how the turbulence actually follows. But if we were to just move it in a circular path, you can clearly see that everything is moving in a circular path. So that's not exactly what we want. If you don't want to create a loop, the easiest thing that you could do is go to the object properties and just add in a driver to any one of these. So let's say you want it to go from left to right. You can go ahead and just take this location on the X and add in a driver by typing in hash frame divided by some amount. So let's say maybe Maybe frame divided by 20. Now if you were to play the animation you can see that everything slowly moves towards the right side just like this and that might be the animation you're going for. However remember that this is not going to be looping so you would have to render out as many frames as you require. If you want to create a looping animation we can use the same technique that we've done many times before However, we'll have to make a few changes to it. The technique is getting a Bezier circle and making this empty follow that circle. So let's press Shift A and search for a mesh circle or we'll use a curve circle. So now we'll press G Z and just bring it up. Now we're going to go ahead and select our turbulence force field and then go to the constraint properties and add in a follow path constraint. Now for the target, we'll choose the Bezier circle. And if you play around with the offset, you can see that it follows along that particular curve. However, everything also follows that curve 
curve, which is not what we want. So the first thing that we can note is that if we take this turbulence and just move it on the Z axis, it's a lot like moving in another dimension. So we don't actually see the motion in either the left, right or front back directions. It actually looks like a more natural wind or something like that. So in order to get this sort of a motion, the first thing that we'll do is select this Bezier circle and rotate it on the X axis by 90 degrees. Then if we were to play this animation by selecting the empty and just changing the offset, you'll see that right now, while the empty is at the top and the bottom, the waves do move towards the right and then at the bottom, it moves towards the left once again. And I don't quite like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna select this and just scale it up on the Z axis, just like that. And in fact, I might take it and scale it on the X axis by a little bit as well. Now we can go ahead and create the animation by expanding the timeline a little bit, going to our output properties and setting up all of our animation defaults. So we'll change the resolution to 4K by changing this to 200%. Frame rate, I'll keep it at 60 frames per second. Remember, if you don't want to render this out or set it up, you can directly download the rendered out animations at 4K 60 FPS and get the blend files from my Patreon as well. You can do that by either buying this particular tutorial as a product from the shop, or you can join any one of my tiers based on your requirements. I'll keep the frame range to end at something like 600 so that it's a 10 second long animation. Output folder can be wherever you want it to be. File format, I'm going to choose FFmpeg video with the encoding changed from Matroska to MPEG-4 and I'm going to keep the output quality as perceptually lossless. Now, with my empty selected or the turbulence object, I can go over to the constraint properties and on frame zero, I'll change the offset to a value of zero and I'll just press this little dot or hover over the value and tap the letter I. Then I'll go to frame 600 and I'll change this offset to 100. And again, I'll either tap I while hovering over it or I'll press that little diamond over here. Now, when you play the animation, it's actually gonna start off very slow and then speed up towards the middle and slow down again. To fix that, you can go down here and press T and choose linear and that way it should move with a constant speed. If you still see that it's moving faster towards these corners or these sides, and it's actually being a lot slower towards this area, you can select the Bezier circle and press Ctrl A and choose apply all transforms. So that way, when you play it, it should move at a constant speed. Now, if you were to actually view it, it seems like it's moving very slow, but in reality, it isn't. You're going to see that the playback might be a lot slower. It of course depends on your system, but my system is currently playing it back at only 14 or 15 frames per second. However, I want to render it at 60 frames per second. So to see a realistic idea of how fast it's going to be moving, you can change this playback from play every frame to frame dropping. And that way you can see how fast it's going to be rendered in your final scene. If you think it's too fast, you can go ahead and make it slower. But if you think it is too slow, you can go ahead and make it faster, all by selecting this and playing around with the distance that this last keyframe moves. If you bring it closer, it's going to be faster. If you move it further, it's going to be slower. But remember, wherever you keep this keyframe, you'll have to change the end to that keyframe as well. But with that, you should be done with the entire animation section. Now, the only thing that's left to do is the actual text string. So for the text string, you can start off by going to the render properties and switching on bloom and screen space reflections. Then we'll switch our viewport shading to render so that we can see the changes as we make them. Then we'll go ahead and bring our cursor to the junction of these two windows, click and drag to create a new window, and then change this from the 3D viewport to the shader editor. To remove the side panel, you can tap the letter N and that will be removed. Now you can select the actual plane and go over to the material properties and press this new button to create a new material. Now let's zoom in and start playing around with the principal BSDF. The first thing that I want is to make it a lot more metallic so that we get much nicer reflections. Along with that, I'll actually reduce the roughness to something like 0.4 and that looks really cool by itself. However, I want the actual tips of these strands to actually light up. And to get just the tips to light up, we can go ahead and use the texture coordinates and check which areas are above a certain threshold. So let's press Shift A and search for a texture coordinate node and from the object socket of this texture coordinate, we'll have to separate out the X, Y, Z. Now, once we have just the Z value, we can compare if it is greater than a certain value. So let's search for a math node and then change this from add to greater than. And now by plugging the Z in over there, we can just use this threshold to control which area is going to light up. So now we can expand this emission and use this value as the strength. Remember this value is either going to be zero or one based on whether or not the region is greater than this threshold value. Let's go ahead and plug this into the strength and you can see that absolutely nothing is lighting up. So that means that 0.5 is clearly way above the region. So let's go ahead and start reducing this 
this until we get a little bit of it to light up. So you can see somewhere around here, we are able to get just the tips to light up. So I think I'm going to go ahead and keep it at a value of maybe 0.075. And that way, just these tips are actually lighting up which is exactly what I wanted. Now let's press zero to go into my camera view and you can see that just a little bit is lit up. However, there's a few issues to this as well. Firstly, the light is way too prominent. So to move that away, let's just select the light, press G followed by X and move it over to the side. And I think that looks better. However, you can definitely keep it wherever you want. Maybe I'll just press GZ and lift it up by a little bit. And I think that looks really cool. The next thing is that even though the tips are lit, they aren't fairly bright. So to make them much brighter, we can select the plane once again. And before this value goes into the strength, we can multiply it by a large number. So let's press Shift A and search for a math node and plug that in right there. We'll switch this from add to multiply and we'll actually multiply it by some high value. Let's go with a value of five and that way it becomes a lot brighter. You could go as bright as you want. Once you have that set to be as bright as you want and your animation looks great, you can go ahead and play around with the colors of everything. The first thing is that these tips don't have to be white. Maybe I'll make it a slightly bluish color. So just lift it up like that. Now this base color as well can be lifted all the way to white or give it a slightly bluish color as well. So all of this is your own artistic preference. So I'll maybe leave it just like that. Similarly, the light that's actually giving illumination to this region can also have a slightly bluish tint. And if you want to get too artistic, you can always give it a different color as well and make this dual tone. And that's really up to your liking and what you see or envision from this animation. But I think this looks really cool, but let's go ahead and change this base plane as well. For that, let's go to the world properties and change the background to either be completely black that gives this sort of a look, which is really cool in its own right. Or let's lift it up by a little bit and make this either a bluish color or a greenish color, or maybe a third color based on your color palette. In my situation, I'm going to lift it and make it slightly bluish. And I think that looks really cool. Remember that before you render, it's always good to make sure that everything is proper because remember in our particle settings, which we can just get by selecting the plane and going to the particle properties, the display amount is not equal to the render amount. So if you were to see it at the rendered value, this is what it currently looks like. So I think that might be a little too bright. So in order to reduce this brightness, we're going to have to either reduce the strength to bring it down, maybe something like five or increase this threshold instead of 0.5. 75, maybe make it 7, 8, and that way far fewer are actually lit up. Now, by increasing the actual display amount, you can see that this actually gives this really foggy effect, and that might look exactly like what you want. But in case that isn't what you want and you liked it better, you can always reduce the render amount as well and change both of them back to what it was. So something like 10. So again, it's really up to you to see what suits your requirements, but I'm going to try and render out as many variations as I can and have all of them available for all of you to use in your own projects. And if you're happy with the way this looks, you can go ahead and render animation. I really hope you enjoyed this tutorial and you learned something from it. You can create so many variations from this simple setup. And that's why I think this is a very powerful technique. Even though I'm not uploading every single day, I am trying to upload useful blend files and previous blend files that I haven't even made tutorials on, on Patreon so that anybody who's subscribed to my monthly tiers will keep receiving useful content. So if you think that that's something that interests you, definitely check it out and be assured that as soon as I feel a little better, I will start posting videos every single day. Until my next video comes out, check out the hundreds of videos that's just waiting on my channel for you to discover them. Until then, thank you so much for watching. Keep creating and don't forget to stay creative.